and welcome back to another production of Go Be Wyoming. This is episode five of season four. This is another full-length interview with the president of the Petroleum Association of Wyoming, or also known as PAW, Pete Obermuller. But first, a spot for one of our great sponsors, Fine Sight and Sound. Fine Sight and Sound are your Rocky Mountain audio and visual experts. They can custom design and install home theaters, home Wi-Fi networks, indoor and outdoor audio and visual experiences, and more. They recently just completed the new audio system for the Sheridan Troopers baseball baseball field here in Sheridan, Wyoming. Go to their website at fssavpro.com and call owner Aaron Perez for a free consult. Pete Obermuller is a Casper native and had a fun and exciting career on Capitol Hill for multiple Wyoming uh, United States representatives, uh, Barbara Cuban and Cynthia Lummis. His experience leading the House Western Caucus and uh, passion for policy has led him back to Wyoming and is leading the way at PAW. Pete and I discussed the history of PAW uh, as well as the oil and gas industry in Wyoming. Uh, We discussed some basic terms of the industry to help educate and bring awareness uh, of their impact to the state of Wyoming. We also cover uh, the recent win uh, against the federal government and the Biden administration uh, banning uh, oil and gas leases and drilling on federal lands, um, as well as ways Wyoming citizens, uh, P- the PAW, and oil and gas professionals can keep educating, advocating uh, the importance of the industry moving forward, uh, especially when it comes to Wyoming. Uh, go check out their website at www.pawyo.org. So that's pawyo.org uh, for more information. And they have free educational materials on there uh, to the public. Also, if you want to see former Vice President, uh, yeah, former Vice President Mike Pence in Cheyenne, book your tickets to the Rockies Petroleum Con- Conference uh, August 24th through the 26th. That's on their website, and you can buy tickets there. You do not need to be a PAW member. You can just go on there and book your tickets. Um, and lastly, before we jump into our conversation with Pete, we take, uh, take this break here for one more sponsor, Fly Sheridan. Save time, fly local, fly Sheridan. You can now book direct flights from the Sheridan County Airport to Denver International, operated by SkyWest Airlines. Don't take long road trips just to catch that connecting flight back into Denver. You can book your direct flight at united.com and go Sheridan right into Denver International. Now, here is our interview with President of the Petroleum Association of Wyoming, Pete Obermuller. All right. Welcome back in, Wyoming Knuckleheads. Um, we are sitting down with a director of PAW, which is the Petroleum Association of Wyoming, Pete Obermuller. Pete, how's it going? Great, Aaron. Thanks a lot for having me. Happy to be here. Yeah. You know, if anyone is rolling through Gobi Wyoming's original episodes, uh, which was about two years ago, Pete was on a couple times, um, and we were talking about uh, PAW and what they do. So, um, Pete, we're going to kind of do a whole start from the beginning, you know, a little bit uh, history on you, and then um, we'll kind of do a history on PAW as well. Great. Sounds good. So yeah, um, for for me, I'm just a, I'm just a Wyoming kid, um, and uh, uh, went away for a while and came back. So I grew up in Casper, went to Natron County High School, and uh, after I, I graduated from there, I uh, I left the state for uh, about 20 years. Uh, went to went to undergrad in Minnesota, and then worked there for a while, and then ended up uh, out in Washington D.C., which is where I kind of wanted to be for quite a while. It just took a while to to get there, but uh, worked on Capitol Hill um, for a, a short period for a senator from Minnesota. Uh, and then uh, as soon as there was an opening, I jumped over into the Wyoming office. Uh, at the time, it was uh, former Representative Barbara Cuban, uh, who was the first one to kind of really give me a shot over there. So I'm, uh, uh, she's always kind of going to be my hero for that and uh, started in her office. And then uh, and then when Cynthia Lummis won that seat, when Barbara retired, uh, Cynthia kept me on and uh, worked for her for uh, most of her time in, in the House office, um, uh, was her legislative director for, for most of it, 
uh, and also was uh, headed up um, uh, a caucus in the House, um, about 40, 45 members uh, who work on Western and rural issues called the, the House Western Caucus. I ran that when Cynthia was the chairman, too, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, at the 2013, 2014 uh, or so, um, I was... Um, uh, wondering whether or not I was going to be a lifer out there uh, in the swamp, as it were, or uh, if I should make it back west to Wyoming, and and I uh, was kind of kind of looking around, um, and ended up moving back here to work for the County Commissioners Association, which is uh, it's a trade association, just represents all the county commissioners statewide. So, uh, 23 counties, 90, uh, 21 counties, 93 commissioners, and uh, I did that for five years before. Um, coming over to the Petroleum Association in, in 2019. So that's the awesome. that's the brief history, brief boring history for, for me. <laughs> um, well, I want to, before we talk about history of PAW, um, you, you said you were kind of in charge of the Western Caucus there. What other, um, you know, lessons did you get from working on Capitol Hill that has, has helped you in, in leading PAW last couple of years? Yeah, it's it, it was a fantastic job. People ask me a lot if I if I liked living in D.C. or if I miss living in D.C. and and honestly, the answer to both is is yeah, I, did, I liked it a lot and I miss it. Um, not everything about it, but it was just uh, you know traffic is terrible and uh, uh, you know it just takes forever to get anywhere and I don't miss riding the train to work every day. Um, that was kind of a drag to be honest, <laughs> but. <laughs> But it was a real privilege to be on Capitol Hill and be able to uh, just wander the halls of the Capitol. Um, uh, I guess that's sort of back before the time when people thought they could wander whenever they wanted to. I guess, but regardless, sure. um, it was. I, I always felt like it was. Um, I always felt like it was a real privilege to be there, and I, I really enjoyed my time. I'm a policy nerd. Um, I, I like. Uh, working on legislation, I like trying to figure out how to how to get it to pass, and and working for the Western Caucus, running the Western Caucus, and then also doing energy policy for Representative Lummis, uh, just started to give me a really broad perspective on um, on what kind of policies are necessary in order to help mm -hmm. Wyoming move forward, and and the obstacles put in place by our own federal government for particularly for public land states like Wyoming. It's really, really hard to explain to people back east uh, what that means. They don't. I mean, and it's totally bipartisan. The misunderstanding, Aaron. It's not. It's not just Democrats. Um, uh, we found we had every bit as much trouble talking to uh, people on our own side of the aisle uh, in D.C. Uh, from Virginia or wherever about uh, how difficult it is when half your state surface and two thirds of your subsurface are owned by the federal government. You can't barely wake up in the morning without the federal government's permission. And it's hard to, it's hard to explain that and kind of get past square one, even, even with your allies, uh, in, in DC. Sure. And so, um, that, that was really, um, I learned a lot about that, about how to communicate about public lands and, and, and just how to try to explain what that means. Cause, um, uh, both for working for the counties and for PAW, it's, uh, I mean, you know, you guys are, uh, based up there in, 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 in some beautiful, beautiful country. And, I, you know, I always talk about it from a Wyoming standpoint. I'm kind of jumping ahead here, Aaron. Sorry, but you got me, no, you got me going already. Um, we, we have such a complicated relationship with federal, with public lands in Wyoming. I mean, I know I personally, but I think it's true for, for a lot of Wyomingites. We love our public lands. We love the open space. We love the access to it. We love the the ability to go places where nobody else is and uh, hunt for the things we want to hunt, fish for the things we want to fish for, and all that. And it's amazing. And yet, the federal government, generally, the federal government's methods for managing those lands frustrate the living daylights out of me for sure, but a lot of my fellow Wyomingites too. So it's kind of a it's it's really it's a it's a complicated relationship. Uh, and it, it spreads the gamut to people who want it to be kind of all public lands and kind of shut everything down and people who uh, want to get rid of it all and everywhere in between. And, uh, and that, makes, that makes policy in this state really complicated for a small state with only three people in a federal delegation. It's, it, it makes it a challenge out in D.C. for sure. Yeah, for sure. No, and I, 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 you can keep going when you get going because that's exactly <laughs> what we're going to hopefully talk about. Sure. You know, because uh, uh, there's no secret about where we're at right now as a state and, and where we're at as a country, too, in regards to 
natural resources and public mm-hmm. lands. Um, yeah. Pete, real quick, for anyone that's not familiar with uh, PAW, uh, just give us a little rundown um, of its history. You know, I was kind of on the website. You know, it, it sounds like it started honestly back in 1920 with Governor yeah. Brooks. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. It's um, the, 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 no, the organization itself, Petroleum Association, will, will turn 50 in 2024. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm looking forward to planning some parties for that. Uh, yes. But we initially we were formed back in uh, 100 years ago, uh, 100 and, 102 years ago now, as part of the Rocky Mountain Oil and Gas Association, which was a, a, con- it's a conglomeration of us, Colorado, uh, North Dakota, uh, I think Montana was in it too. Uh, I have to go back and back and look. Um, but it, yeah, it was it's was formed in Wyoming. Governor Brooks was a, was a part of that. Sort of realizing, it's really amazing. Aaron and I, I recently moved our headquarters office in Casper from just from one building to the other, and so we were going through all the uh, old documents in the Petroleum Association. And um, you wouldn't believe. I mean, we we would have. You kind of uncover and blow off, blow off the dust of these minutes from our from our meetings back in um, way back in the 30s and the 40s. Just stunning, wow. a, a bit of, of um, history. But I kind of uh, carefully paged through it, and you wouldn't believe it, Aaron. The minutes in there are talking about how can we best communicate to people the importance of oil and gas. How like we're we're losing the battle in communicating to people back east how important these natural resources are. This is like nineteen thirty, you know, and I mean, man, oh man. I mean we've been around working on this forever and it's just it goes to show you that uh, it's 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 a you, you're never gonna you, you're never gonna win. You you constantly kind of always have to be on the field discussing these things. Anyway, sure. um, so yeah, so hundred years and then in nineteen seventy four um, moved uh you know created um uh, uh petroleum association of wyoming and that's still the the uh the organization now and so we we represent uh, basically um pretty much anybody who uh, is part of the oil and gas um uh sphere in wyoming so ranging from exploration production the upstream and then pipelines and transportation midstream refineries and sort of uh, downstream and then everybody who's kind of around that space you know your um your petroleum engineers your landmen your um uh your uh, wildlife biologists your environmental consultants uh law firms that, that do a lot of work in oil and gas uh, just basically anybody who is in and around the space uh, can be a member of paw and yeah. you know, represent all of them uh, as well so uh, in contrast to some other states that have sort of competing associations wyoming has a uh, uh, petroleum association of wyoming alone we're the, we're the voice for the oil and gas industry which is the economic driver of the state of wyoming by a very long shot uh, so it's an interesting job for sure uh, pete uh- you, you kind of covered them already. You kind of mentioned uh, upstream, midstream, and downstream. Mm-hmm. Um, give us this. You kind of and you kind of gave an explanation, but um, I think some people. This is again the education part. I think some people don't understand what those. You know, they've yeah. probably heard it and they're like, okay. Um, but uh, just a quick, uh, quick, sorry, quick overview of each three of those um, uh, uh, industries, I guess, or yeah. categories in the industry. Yeah, I really appreciate that question, actually, Aaron, because it, it's, it, you know, Wyoming people in general have a higher IQ about oil and gas and natural resources than, than lots of other states. And then, but even in Wyoming, different, different areas of Wyoming have a, a higher level of IQ about this stuff, too, just if it's in and around their, their areas. And so um, uh, it's a real failing of ours sometimes that we kind of we, we gloss over things and, and don't. Uh, take time to talk about what these things mean and it's kind of it's it's actually really important right now which I'll get to in a second uh, to, to answer your question but so so when people say upstream what they're usually what they're talking about is the exploration for and then the production of oil and gas resources uh, from from the ground so Wyoming is primarily an upstream state uh, that's where that's where all of our we have the resource we explore for it and we produce it here in great quantities um, you know eighth largest producer in the nation um, but uh, you go one step below that what people call midstream is the transportation of that resource to places where it can get refined and then used in a final product Wyoming is by far and away 
the largest exporter of energy in the United States. We produce, you add in coal, we produce so much energy here, we don't have the population to use it. We essentially just export uh, so much of our energy and that's where midstream comes in. We have a really complex network of pipelines in the state, thankfully, because that can get our product to market, which is where we need it to go. And, and then when it gets to that market, our market, the upstream and midstream market is really the refiners for the most part. And those are you know, major refineries in, in Oklahoma and on the Gulf Coast. We have some refineries here in Wyoming, too, um, that are sort of big for our region, but, but small and compared to those, those ones down in, in, in Oklahoma. And those are called downstream. Uh, that's uh, you know obviously the the processes the the crude uh, in order to to the products that we use every day both for vehicles and and and, and all the other uses that that are used for which is which are legion uh, and then the the people we don't represent which is kind of confusing is we don't represent the retailers the the convenience stores or the gas stations where you where you go and fill up your pump uh, or fill up your car uh, where the pumps are uh, there's only I, I can't remember. Aaron, you'll have to fact check me on this. I, I think it's something like 2% of gas stations in the United States are owned by a company that that uh, does the exploration and production that are totally vertically integrated like that. So you'll okay. go with maybe a Shell station or even a BP station and it might be branded that, but it's not owned by that company. But for the most part, it's not that. It's your Loaf and Jug, you know, uh, your Maverick, uh, you know, whatever those sorts of, of, of C stores are that are separated uh, from the exploration and production part. Sure. And Which a lot is of important people... now because of obviously yeah. the gas prices. But, but real quick, Aaron, just going back, why it's yeah. so important you ask this question, upstream exploration and production, we often talk about those together, but they're two very different things. And, and we, we combine them because they're upstream, but right now it's really important while the, while the Biden administration and others are talking about how we have these leases that that there's not drilling on and, and all that kind of stuff. They're they're combining exploration and production as if it were the same. Mm -hmm. That if an oil and gas company uh, gets a lease on previously unexplored land, you have to go find the resource. You have to figure out where it is. You have to figure out whether you can actually reach it and produce it in a way that is economical. That's the exploration part. And uh, and when you have these so-called, in part, when you have some of these so-called unused leases, that's where exploration is happening. Just by getting a lease to drill doesn't mean that there's oil there and you immediately you're producing, which is what a lot of people conflate is that as the two happen together, they're actually separate and often they're separate company types of companies that do it. Smaller companies will explore take all the risk, find a resource, and then they'll pr usually turn that around to a bigger company, say like your Devon or, or Oxy or Continental or something like that, who has the economy of scale to actually put a rig up and get what you have found. Uh, and and there's a, there's, that's a pretty big distinction for us in Wyoming as an upstream state. Uh, but right now it's talked about a lot as if they're exactly the same. Yeah, and I think you talked about too, I think some people don't understand a lot of capital has to go into those smaller companies to do the exploration because like you mentioned you might miss and you know yeah. and that's and there's risk there and and that's uh um no and that's great no i'm glad you uh explained that a little bit because yeah some people don't understand that there even though um one of our i think i have this right one of the oldest wells in wyoming was 1883 is yeah. that right yeah right yeah that was first well i believe yeah the first yeah. well and i mean we've got a long history but that doesn't mean you go out and hit uh any of these federal leases you're going to hit something so um and technology changes so so dramatically i mean i mean it wasn't you know those wells in 1883 and then obviously for a long long time those are just the vertical wells you poke a hole straight down and you pull out from that particular reservoir the powder river basin really was didn't have really anything when vertical wells were the only game in town Powder River Basin and you know Commerce in Campbell County, which is the sweet spot now. That was all technology advancements that allowed us to we knew the resource was there, couldn't get it. Now we can get it, and that's where the, that's where all the rigs are today. There, not all, but but ninety percent of them are are in Campbell and Converse doing horizontal drilling. So you know, so you know, when people say, well, there's not much resource there, maybe that's true now, but but uh, our ability. To, to leap forward in technology just just opens up so much more space in Wyoming. Yeah, for sure. Um, 
No, this is all great. Um, let's keep on this this track of the federal lands and especially mm-hmm. the policy side. You know, because yeah. you mentioned right now from the Biden administration, and and then again, it's the education part. You know, people are not they're putting together exploration and production. And we, we're already kind of behind the ball on like, well, two thirds of the federal minerals in Wyoming are, you know, um, or sorry, two thirds of the minerals in Wyoming are federal. So when right. you're doing these policies, um, you know, what other challenges are, are popping up, um, you know, that you guys are seeing? Yeah, well, I, we've got a lot of headwinds right now, and it's been um, it's been frustrating for a number of reasons. Um, I can I can kind of walk through all of them uh, relatively briefly. But before moving moving off the federal lands part, I mean, I think, or at least the Biden administration part, um, oftentimes these these discussions get real partisan real fast. And right. um, I don't I don't intend for it to be that way, but it is the policy, their own stated policy of this administration to to end leasing and perhaps even drilling on federal lands entirely. So you'll recall that they uh, they put that moratorium on leasing for 18 months, didn't have a lease in Wyoming. Uh, they finally, the courts finally ordered them to do it. And when they did it, the White House press secretary said in their press conference, and you can look it up, um, she said that they had to do it they, they did it because they had to, and it remains the policy of this administration to ban future leasing on federal lands. A couple days later, Gina McCarthy, who's the White House environmental advisor, said that it that President Biden, quote, remains committed to ending drilling on federal lands, unquote. Uh, so you can just take them at their word. They don't they don't want it here, and uh, they would like to get rid of it. And that kind of open hostility from the federal government makes um, interest in investing here, um, uh, you know, hard. Um, yeah. you know, it's it's difficult to convince folks to come here when when your own federal government is openly uh, calling for the end end of the uh, of it here. So um, currently, the laws on our side they have to do leases, all that they can't just just shut it down, uh, at least not immediately. So, so that's a pretty big headwind. There are others though, given everything that's happened in this world the past couple of years that everyone's dealing with. Um, part of what the, what the administration is doing, uh, to make life difficult is, is, um, working and uh, putting pressure on private banks, but working in federal in the you know federal sphere in terms of access to capital. Uh, mm-hmm. So the ability, you know, these these wells by themselves at thirteen million dollars to to drill a well, and so you you can't really move fast without having some financial backing in order to do that. It's of some kind, uh, right. and it's getting increasingly hard to get that in the open market um, for a number of reasons, but but in part because of the push from the federal government. So the, yeah. the upshot of that is companies are, um, well, okay, we got We have to be able to do this on our own cash flow, is what they're saying. And you'll remember but in the last crash, when there were all these bankruptcies and, and all companies had really kind of gone a little too far, borrowing too much and drilling a little too fast, uh, it, it, when the crash happened, their balance sheet was in the situation to manage that. So the narrative at that time was, well, what's wrong with these like you know, this like cowboy attitude? Why, why did you guys overextend yourselves and now you're in this trouble? Um, so you know, get what you asked for. Companies are now operating under their cash flow and uh, and self financing this, which is really slowing down how fast rigs can come back to Wyoming. We're only halfway back to where we were. Uh, the month before the pandemic shut everything down, um, 32 rigs I think in January of 2020, wow. and we have we have um, 16 today. So um, uh, so that that is slowing things down, for sure. Right. Um, and then we, we're not immune to all the problems everybody else is having in terms yeah. of respect for workforce. In fact, that is a really big workforce is a really big challenge for us right now. We have. Uh, uh, you know, there's several different types of rigs, the ones that like drill the well, and then there's ones that kind of complete the well, that do the fracking job. There's, I don't get into the details of that, but but each one of those has a different crew. And, and you know, there's several idled uh, rigs in Wyoming that don't have people to run them. Uh, and and so companies, particularly the smaller companies, are just waiting in line. The company told me the other day they can't, they know they can't get a rig until late October at the earliest, even though they're ready to do uh, a drilling program today. So right. um, workforce is a real challenge. 
amazingly supply chain is, is bothering us too. Steel is hard to come by. If you can believe it, fracking sand is hard to come by. One mm-hmm. of the things that I'm, uh, we're exploring at PAW is, is can we identify a, uh, a place in Wyoming where we can produce fracking sand ourselves? And, and, and we get a lot of it from Wisconsin and other places. Uh, you know, working with the geological survey to find is there an economical uh, resource in Wyoming where we can just shorten that supply chain and have our own yeah. source of frac sand, uh, which would be amazing. I don't know if it's possible, but working on it um, uh, right now. So, so there's that. Um, uh, uh, you know, lots, lots of headwinds like that. Um, and then also just, just one last one, and we can move off of this. Is is just honestly just a weird accident of timing. So there's a really big oil and gas field down in South Central Wyoming, the Wamsutter field in, in Sweetwater County. Um, BP operated it for a long time, uh, and it's a really productive field. BP has made its own strategic choices and uh, has decided to kind of exit fossil fuels entirely. Um, uh, over time, but they exited Wyoming, and in the process of exiting Wyoming, they stopped investing uh, in Wyoming. It's just a business decision. I'm not disparaging it. It's, it's what it is. Right. Other company that was operating down there got into real financial trouble and so stopped investing. And so uh, uh, Williams and a company called Crowheart have taken over that field, and they're invested, and they are investing. And this all happened sort of at the same time as the rest of this. So that field's not really operating, but then they came in and it's taken them some time to get ramped back up. But already this year, they've turned back to production about 125 wells that had been idle. They've brought them back online, production happening. They have goals to, to turn on an additional 250 wells. Those are wells that are already out there. They just need to be turned back on and, and you know, yeah. kind of cleaned up and, and then production comes back from those. And so we'll start seeing stuff come back in Wyoming because of that, uh, the, that kind of activity as well. That's awesome. Well, and just to sum up what you said, you know, I've um, right when the pandemic hit and you started seeing all these mergers and mm-hmm. all these companies kind of, uh, they're like, look at our balance sheets. You know, I think there is a, there is a uh, flip of the coin to COVID, I think, you know, I think it taught some of these wildcatters and these smaller operators to, hey, you can't run and gun like we used to, you know, because, uh, you know, COVID and then running out of money. And I, I do think that is a, a black eye right now. People are like, why aren't you guys going fast? And it's like, well, we don't have the, ca- you know, we don't have the capital. And um, if you guys are going to shut us down again, you know, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, right. I've never, I haven't, I, I know a lot of operators or, um, companies that are the small drilling types uh, what would be needed for frac sand pete if you know what are we looking for in wyoming i didn't even think of that because that's a big issue for a lot of these guys yeah it's it's a particular type and, and uh, i'll get out over my skis real quickly on it because i'm not a you know i'm not a <laughs> geologist I don't, I don't know i don't know a lot about it other than uh it is a particular kind of sand that they can they can grind to a uh, to a consistency and to a size that is necessary for those jobs. You know, it's it's yeah. basically whatever it is, like 90 percent uh, water and, and sand, ninety five percent water and sand. But but it can't just be um, it can't be any old sand that either degrades or or crushes itself or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. It has to it has to be able to to work in the fundamentals of the wellbore itself in order to get pushed out into the shale. The, uh, where it, where it's been cracked and then hold the yeah. sand is uh, just holds into tiny tiny minuscule cracks holds those open which is what allows then the resource to flow into the well bore and out that's the uh, that's the in, in, uh, the genius of it is these yeah. these just minuscule cracks that allow the resource to flow and you need the sand to be the exact right consistency to make that work and mm-hmm. I don't know that we have that type of rock. In, sure. in quantities and in a single location where it makes it economical to mine it. Um, but if we do, uh, heck, we should explore that. Heck yeah. No, that'd be great. Um, no, very cool. No, that's the first time I've ever heard of that idea. That's cool. Um, it, it's two, uh, one last question, and then we'll kind of get into kind of more Wyoming focused stuff, Pete. Mm-hmm. Um, it, talking about the, the recent court decisions, you know, uh, mm-hmm. what's that looking like moving forward? Um, you know, I think sometimes we get impatient, you know, they made that decision and yet the Biden administration's like, well, we're sticking to it. And it's kind of like, OK, well, now we got to keep going through this process. Uh, you know, I know PAW, I, uh, the WEA, you, you know, many groups are pushing on that. What's the next step? You know, I guess 
in regards to the courts, you know, taking it to the courts and, and pushing yeah. this administration um, to at least, I think, having a sale, a lease sale. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, you're right. And, uh, you know, really it boils down to, Aaron, that um, Congress has really has really failed in its job. And I say that as a guy who really likes Congress. Um, yep. kind of, I'm one of those guys that I bristle a little bit when people talk about co-equal branches of government because mm-hmm. the branches aren't co-equal. Congress is the most powerful. Congress can do what it wants, when it wants. And it's chosen to not do that. It abdicates its authority to the president and to presidential agencies, and that's harmful for America. And in this particular, in my opinion, in this particular case, it's harmful for Wyoming because uh, the the law grants a lot of grants a lot of discretion to the um, uh, Department of Interior with respect to uh, the the amount of and location for leases. Now, where it doesn't grant discretion is that they have to have them. And right now, the Biden administration is saying that it grants discretion even in that. And what what, what the Western Energy Alliance and, and, and Petroleum Association uh, took to court was that question. It, is, it, is it or is it not optional for the federal government to hold lease sales? We believe it is not optional. We think that that's pretty clear. State of Wyoming agreed and, and, and filed suit as well. They just had a hearing on the merits of that case uh, here in Cheyenne uh, two weeks ago, uh, and so I was able to go listen to those arguments. And um, I think, uh, uh, of course, I'm biased, but I think the state of Wyoming and 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 our attorneys had a pretty good case. Uh, uh, but it's not like it's it's completely open and shut. Uh, and that's right. that's sort of that's Congress's fault. We the honest truth is we really don't have a coherent energy policy in this country. And what we have, and because from Congress, and because of that, what we have is whatever the president wants at the current time. So President Trump's policy was quite a bit different than President Biden's, and whoever right. follows President Biden will have a different policy than President Biden. And and the uh, um, the uh, you know the victims of that, if I can use that word, maybe that's too strong of a word, but but the people who have to deal with that are us and and people in Wyoming and state government and all of that is ever shifting climate where there's not a coherent policy set by where those things should be set, the Article One branch of government, the legislature. So yeah. um, kind of my soapbox about Article One branch, but um, but that's well, that, why, it's why it's why we have to go to court because yeah. the agency does what it wants based on its interpretation, and we and then the courts end up deciding what it was that Congress meant when Congress could decide what it meant. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Well, and I think, you know, I don't think that was a soapbox at all. I think people are starting to realize there is no leadership um, in regards to the in, – and in, we'll just keep this on energy. Mm-hmm. Just like you said, it's very incoherent. I mean, other than Biden. I mean, he's been – like you said, they're, they're pretty clear at what they yeah. want to do. But right. Congress, yeah. they're not really sure. And it's like, well, this is why we're in this situation. So that's interesting. So not shutting, you know, closed, you know, but I think there still is potential for maybe if Congress – can get some leadership in a decision made, you know, that I guess there's still hope in regards to the policy in the courts. Yeah. Um, yeah and so, to, I mean, to, I, to answer your specific question, the next step now is for Jessica Abdal or uh, I know in Louisiana where the um, injunction happened that, that required Biden to do the lease, the current lease sale, that's been appealed. So that's moving through its process. Um, and, and ours is, is waiting for a ruling now after hearing after that hearing. And so we'll see uh, what, you know, how that shakes out. Awesome. Well, we'll keep our eyes on it. And I, I did see that article and I thought, what a great win for Wyoming, at least in, in that mm-hmm. uh, hearing, you know, and um, no, that's great stuff. Okay. Um, you know, let's bring it back to Wyoming a little bit. You did mention kind of the economic impact that oil and gas has specifically on Wyoming. Right. Um, you know, walk us through some of the numbers. Um, you know, I think um, the best numbers that we have kind of to give everyone in perspective was 2019, 2020, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, or, well, end of 2020 wasn't great. But, um, yeah, what, what are kind of the um, impacts that Wyoming sees from oil and gas? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty dramatic, really, uh, uh, both from a revenue side, 
um, to the state and local governments, but also just from a, a, a gross domestic product, just the, what keeps the economy churning in Wyoming, um, uh, regardless of government spending, uh, just the the amount of capital and people necessary to to uh, you know extract resources in Wyoming uh, is really. Um, I said before, it's the economic driver. I mean, there's just no, uh, no matter how you measure it, that's true. Uh, with respect to GDP, we always talk about Wyoming being kind of a three-legged stool in terms of its economy, um, energy, travel and tourism and agriculture. Um, but when it, when it comes to actual you know, economic activity, it's, uh, it's a pretty odd three-legged stool. It's really one leg uh, and, and a couple of stumps, uh, quite frankly. Um, uh, Travel and tourism and agriculture combined in its economic activity doesn't equal half of the economic activity that comes from from energy, uh, just from pure economics. Now I know there's cultural uh, and, and and recreational reasons why the other two are important, and that's great. I, in fact, I want those to do as, to be very successful as well. Yeah, uh, but they but they they don't they don't measure in comparison, and so then when, and when you shift over to government. Uh, you know, all taxes combined, I think, in 2019, it was $1.67 I think. I'd have to look at my own numbers on that. But I know it's right on our website, pawyo.org. You can see all these facts and figures. We update them as soon as they're available So um, uh, about that. So that, I mean, just to put that in perspective, $1.6 billion in, in, in tax revenue to the state. Uh, yeah. Wyoming's general fund budget on a yearly basis is $3 billion. So, you know, oil and gas by itself is more than half of the state's general fund budget on a yearly basis. Right. And what that equates to is um, the, the, uh, the low cost. We always like to brag about how, uh, you know, we're such a low tax state. No, no business income tax, no personal income tax, very, very low property taxes, even though people are kind of nervous about those right now because mm -hmm. uh, property values are going up. Trust right. me, I lived in Northern Virginia in a postage stamp of a townhouse and paid four times the property tax that I pay for my single family house here in Cheyenne. I mean, it's just, it's no comparison if you've ever lived anywhere else, how right. low our property taxes are. All of that is because of natural resources. It essentially equates to about uh, a two, a $2,800 subsidy, $2,800 for every man, woman, and child in Wyoming that you, that we don't have to pay ourselves. Uh, and uh, that kind of subsidy on uh, for for tax revenue can't be overlooked as well in terms of the economy. Then there's the jobs. Um, yeah. You know, fifteen thousand people work at some point in the industry in some way. Um, that's just direct uh, and indirect. Not the you know, there's a lot of people use, especially in travel and tourism, use induced numbers too, which is you've got people who work directly. You got people who work for some some other company that works for the direct, and that's indirect. And then induced is like that economy creates other jobs. So that's right. When you see a jobs number that uses induced, that's a good way to kind of inflate the numbers. I'm not using induced at all. Um, direct and indirect is is that level, of, um, and just can't be can't be compared. Yeah, yeah. No, 100. percent I would recommend any listener go to the website because like just. Uh, that economic impact that Pete was saying is, is estimated 5 billion, you know, in GDP and just, mm -hmm. in just economy, you know, and, um, and then you've got all the, you know, people employed and all that good stuff. Um, no, that's awesome. Um, Oh, I think we, we touched on it and want to come back. Um, before our last question, uh, midstream, I think, did you oh, say yeah. there was something? Yeah. There's some, some big stuff going on. Uh, and some big news uh, for Wyoming in midstream um, that I didn't know if you wanted to talk about or just highlight. Yeah. Um, it, so there's we luckily we have a pretty good network, as I was saying, of 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 ways to uh, export our resources. Uh, so uh, you know, part of why like the Keystone Pipeline was such a big deal uh, nationally is uh, is a you know, able to get Canadian. Uh, crude into market. You know, we have a lot of North American sources of energy, which is a lion's share of what we use domestically. But also for the Bakken in North Dakota, which actually the Bakken does not have 
great export capacity. One of their limiting factors is their their pipeline um, capacity, and they have to get, get a, they have to truck it out. Quite frankly, in a lot of ways, yeah. we don't we don't have to do that. We've got a, a pretty good um, a pretty good network. So. Um, uh, so that, that that's really great. We also have, um, interestingly, we have a really, um, we've sort of under under Governor Mead, um, they worked on a project with the federal government to sort of pre-approve uh, dedicated corridors for carbon uh, in order to transport uh, carbon via pipeline, uh, so that we can uh, both for sequestration purposes, which I imagine we'll come on to a little bit later, but. Um, uh, but also to get carbon from their source, like coal facilities uh, and other manufacturing um, industrial sites, and move it to legacy oil fields in Wyoming, like in northern Natrona County or up in the Bighorn Basin or those sorts of places, uh, where you can do enhanced oil recovery, you use carbon injection into into oil fields, you inject it down, and that helps to to uh, recover. Um, otherwise unrecoverable or difficult to recover resources. For yeah. example, Aaron, up in up in the Bighorn Basin in Park County near Cody, that field has been in continuous operation for, uh, for 100 years. Uh, and they still expect that they've only accessed 30% of the resource in that field. Wow. Uh, and so it's all about mitigating the external factors up there how much water comes out instead of the resource how to use carbon and other uh you know other um uh, what they call tertiary recovery it's a, a dumb word that just means trying again uh and uh you know to try to figure out how to get get oil out of there so um uh, lots of opportunity there on, on the midstream is moving carbon around which is weird everyone talks about how how, how we've got to get rid of it it's all terrible and i'm i'm fine with that in terms of sequestration but it's actually a resource and a commodity for us in wyoming is to, to capture carbon and move it around and use it yeah so anyway I, i'm not sure what you probably have something in mind on, on midstream i'm not thinking of but but no no that was 100 percent. i was we were just i was thinking of um the announcement of uh, I think there's going to be a sequestration or uh, one of these carbon corridors up to the Campbell County. Um, oh, what's that big thing called? Um, the ITC anyway, up there, the Integrated Test Center, yeah. and the um, uh, oh, geez, what's the coal fire plant called now? Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Anyone listening knows what we're talking about. But yep. there's that big announcement that we're going to have a corridor to mm-hmm. to transport that captured carbon for that. Um, but that's a great. I didn't even know we were uh, companies were looking at that as well for oil fields because. Um, now, uh, I've spoken with, uh, Glenn Morell at WEA and he talked about some of the states we export our natural yeah. resources to, they want it net zero. Right. Well now, Hey, guess what? This oil or gas that we just produced in Wyoming is net zero. Cause we used captured, captured carbon to help, right. you know, uh, you know, so anyways, no, so that's, that's very cool. I didn't know, uh, that that was getting looked at too for a sequestration, uh, carbon, uh, man, uh, sequestration. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. It's sort of the, you'll, you'll hear people say, um, uh, you know, CCS or CCUS, uh, mm-hmm. carbon capture and sequestration. That's, you know, CCS is just putting it underground for long-term storage. CCUS, carbon capture utilization and storage is much more what we're into out here as, as, is the utilization part. So that's yep. used for a resource like capturing the, the 70% uncaptured resource up in, in Park County. Yeah. Heck yeah. Um, no, this is all great. Um, last question, Pete. So, um, you know, how can how can other PAW members or people just in Wyoming help educate like you were talking about when you're on uh, Capitol Hill, you know, even talking to other um, we'll, we'll just say, you know, uh, partisan groups, you know, yeah. that, but this is a whole uh, it seems like it's a na- national thing of kind of educating people on um you know, uh, natural resource management, you know, yeah. really is what this is. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, um, so we have a pretty active, uh, uh you know, um, uh, social media and, 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 uh, earned media outreach efforts. We've really over the past couple of years, really tried to ramp that up quite a bit in order to, uh, mostly just to be in front of our own, uh, friends and neighbors here in Wyoming to make sure that they have a, have a, a solid understanding of what's going on beneath their feet. Uh, and to that end, we're we're actually about to launch. Um, we've we've kind of undergoing this long-term process to 
to launch some communication efforts around specific basins so that mm. people can understand even more locally what's what's literally underneath their own feet. So yeah. we're, we're about to launch one for the Powder River Basin, uh, and then we're going to move on to, to, to four other basins in Wyoming, including um, the Bighorn Basin and, and uh, Shirley Basin and all those other ones where, uh, where we just want people to, to have kind of a better understanding of what's being produced there and what it's used for, where it goes, its impact, that kind of stuff. So some more interactive stuff yeah uh, from from Wyoming standpoint um, you know I think it's uh, for, for me personally I enjoy uh, talking to folks about this I'm willing to go anywhere I'm willing to go into the lion's den to talk about these things uh, uh, because I believe in them and uh, and and, and I, you know, Wyoming's future is is uh, for the foreseeable future um, uh, inextricably tied to its natural resource economy. So, yeah, if any of your listeners are, uh, you know, community groups, or chambers of commerce, any of that kind of thing, I will go anywhere, anytime to to do presentations for for those folks. Late, lately, my conversations about this have really talked a lot about the price people are paying at the pump and its relationship right. to the price of oil and what we can and can't do in Wyoming to help solve that issue. And you know, sort of spoiler alert. It's not, you know, people say like, oh, prices barrel is so high. I got oil and gas companies are just like laughing all over the bank. It's actually not awesome. It's not stable when 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 we're here. Um, what's better for Wyoming and better for everyone is is you know somewhere around the eighty dollar, uh, eighty five dollar mark because that's um, and, and if it could stay there, that's. That stability that doesn't attract weird ideas or you know that kind of thing and um, yep. so it just it, things go better anyway um, that's what I've been talking about <laughs> on these groups about a lot lately and I'm happy to do that uh, other than that yeah it's it's just a matter of of kind of brushing up on, on on knowledge go to our website for that there's others actually the Wyoming State Geological Society has really great information and resources on it and um, be a great guest for you is Erin Campbell the state geologist uh, awesome uh, she's got a lot of interesting stuff to talk about uh, but. Uh, and then just being able to communicate that about how much it's used for for everyday life, from your from your phone to the materials needed to to build wind turbines. Uh, you know, I mean, I got that this right up here. That uh, you know, I'm, I'm about all of the above. But uh, uh, so uh, that it's really just just kind of staying engaged in that. That's the most important. Yeah, yeah, no, and I think you finished on a great piece is in staying engaged. You know, I think. Um, like we were talking about kind of the the federal hearings and things like that you know it's not open and shut you know it's still ongoing mm -hmm. uh, it was still a win but you know there's still some things to happen so you, you can't just disengage and think that's what it is um right. yeah and i would highly recommend go to the website there's there's you guys have free like one on 101 you know educational stuff that yeah. um, glossary <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, and it's it's great. Um, you know, Gobi Wild is going to be doing an energy series, so we're going to be using that. I'll be reaching out to PAW, you and Ryan, about some information um, in regards to that kind of stuff. And uh, when when do you guys expect to have the um, the Powder River stuff out? Probably this summer, or yeah, yeah, this summer for sure. Yep, awesome. Uh, and hopefully, we'll start capturing some some stuff on. I, th I think we're going to do the Bighorn Basin next. I'm not quite sure. I better not uh, not. Yeah, Ryan, no, okay. Ryan, will, Ryan will kill me if I go in the wrong order, so I shouldn't say that. But yeah, uh, the PR, PRB this summer for sure. Mm -hmm. Perfect, awesome. No, yeah. I think that's a great idea for local, you know, people that don't understand what it's done and and what it does and uh, what comes out of there. So, um, Pete, is there anything, any events or anything you guys are holding this summer or in the in the near future that you want to uh, mention to our listeners? Oh, thanks for that softball. Appreciate it. Yeah, so we have um, every August we get together uh, for members, but it's also open to non-members as well. Um, uh, it's 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 our annual meeting, and it's also we we call it the Rockies Petroleum Conference. Um, it is in Cheyenne this year uh, at the end of August, and I'm I'm um, pretty excited to announce that our keynote speaker for the event is uh, former Vice President Mike Pence. Um, we'll be there and uh, and be our keynote address on on August 25th. Uh, so uh, that that information is on our website as well at pwyo.org. And they, I would imagine people can buy uh, probably a, it's a ticketed event. Yep. Yeah, it is yep. a ticketed event. It's uh, you know uh, opportunity for basically the entire industry. Uh, 
to come together and we do um, you know sort of main sessions but also breakout sessions that are more individualized and that kind of thing have a little yeah. fun play a little golf uh, and we'll uh, hear from the CEOs of of Denbury uh, speaking of, of sequestration and also the CEO of Continental Resources a new entrant into Wyoming but a, a very uh, active and aggressive uh, new company uh, already has rigs up in Wyoming so we're gonna hear from those CEOs uh, and then we'll talk about a, a lot of other uh, timely issues, and then that evening of the 25th, so we'll hear from the former vice president. Wonderful. Well, that's a great lineup there, and then, like you said, there's other breakout sessions that everyone mm-hmm. can go to and, and all that stuff, and very informal, have fun, you know, right. it's for the members to get together, and then anyone that's not a member as well, so great. Um, very cool. Well, Pete, I think, thank you for uh, your time. Uh, sorry for the uh, <laughs> the herd of dogs there when the <laughs> mailman came by, but no worries. Um, yeah, we appreciate it. And anytime you guys want to come back on, you guys are always welcome uh, on Go Be Wild. Happy to do it, Aaron. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Good to see you. Yep. Yeah, good to see you too. We'll, we'll catch up later. All righty. All right.